visual recognition and other related problems. And I'm showing you just um, some uh, a good set of them right here. However, this is generally third-person data, meaning taking from an observer's <coughs> perspective, and it's what you would call disembodied. So, you know, it's out of the context of any physical ongoing event. It's kind of a snapshot at a good moment in time and a good place in space to show what the person wanted to capture. So contrast that with egocentric data. When you talk about a first person egocentric or wearable camera feed, you get something that looks like this instead. And rather than being curated and on the special stuff, it's uncurated, it's everything, it's every moment that passes through this agent's eye. Furthermore, you're seeing the world not as a spectator, but as the, the actor, the agent that has certain goals and movements in the world, has interactions with objects and the environment. This has a lot of different properties. Some of them are, yes, like video analysis challenges, but a lot of it, too, is opportunities to gain this kind of um, action, or action and agent-centric understanding of the visual world. So in particular, there's three reasons that we've been really motivated to explore egocentric video um, application-wise. The first one is in augmented reality, where we can envision in the future having wearable devices that see what you see and hear what you hear, and then have an ability to give you just the right information or assistance when you need it. So you could ask questions from some kind of helpful device that doesn't just know what you're saying and hear that, but can see, see your world to know what's relevant for you then. Second of the three, robot learning. Um, so if we want to have robots that manipulate objects that humans use or that navigate in spaces that humans move, then we would love to be able to learn from how humans do these things. And I think egocentric video is such a great tool there to have robots that learn not only from physical experience, but vicariously through our experience captured in these pixels. And third and finally, there's just such um, intrigue looking at COGSI developmental learning and aspects of you know, the, the origins of perception and visual learning in a developmental sense um, against what we can capture in this kind of egocentric view. So I mentioned a second ago, you know, there's kind of curated moments that occupy our typical third-person internet kind of data sets. And so let's call those noteworthy moments, right? So they're, they're interesting for some reason because someone decided to take that picture or take that video, whether that's internet content or a film or just lab capture data for a certain purpose um, in our scientific work. Now, um, what I'm about to show you in the first of the two data resources I wanted to describe which is called Ego 4D, um, we're interested in going from the noteworthy to, I guess, the unnoteworthy. Because we want to be able to capture ongoing and unscripted activity, the things that are just happening because they happen in daily life, but not so much that they're normally worth an, a video, let's say. So why is this interesting? Well, here's kind of how people, in, at least in the US, occupy a majority of their time doing the everyday things. So daily life activity consists of things you do at home, at work, running errands, commuting, um, exercise. A lot of these activities are what actually occupy time and are the kind of things that in augmented reality in the future, or in robot learning in the future, we have to have good perception. Right? So it's these everyday and mundane things that we actually wanted to capture in a thorough way um, in this data set effort called Ego 40. And so to give you a sense of, um, I'm going to tell you some of the facets of the data, show you examples, and say um, why we think it can be interesting and how it's enabling new research. I'll start with scale. Um, if you were to carve out a shape saying, um, you know, on this axis, how many hours of video content is there in the data set, and how many participants took part in the collection, meaning they wore a camera in this case, um, the previous best when we did this work was Epic Kitchens at a really hearty 100 hours of content and I think believe 45 different subjects. Even if you looked at all the past video, egocentric video data sets, put them all in a block, you'd get something like this. And when we announced Ego 4D um, just two years ago at CBPR, um, we're talking about order of magnitude leap on both those dimensions. Because there is in this public open source data set more than 3,000 hours of content in the wild, unscripted, and over 900 people who, who wore the cameras in 74 different worldwide locations. The data is multimodal, we'll come back to that in a bit, and it comes with benchmark tasks to really drive research and first-person perception. All right, so first a glimpse of what Ego4, the video excerpts look like. Um, these are tiny excerpts, like each capture is often around an hour in its whole length, um, and then chopped up in different ways. And here's a little video reel to give you a sense of what I mean by the everyday things and people's 
natural environments in an unscripted manner. So they're doing things at work, chores, um, at home, even in social environments. It's indoor, it's outdoor, even in public spaces and with other people like you see here. And so we're really capturing that mundane, everyday stuff about interactions with people, objects, animals, um, and uh, the way we need to interact with them both in, at work uh, and at home. So a lot of interesting occupations, as you can see some of this, these visually interesting skills that are at play here. Okay, so that's a little glimpse of what Ego40 content looks like. Now let me tell you a bit about its composition and how we got there. So it's geographically diverse, um, and that was not, that was very much on purpose because the team that came together to do this work, 14 different institutions, um, occupy different parts um, of the, the global map. So towards this kind of diverse geographic coverage by joining forces with all the labs you see here for their video expertise as well as their ability to kind of bring these cameras into daily life around their sites. Furthermore, there was a real effort to get diverse demographic coverage among these camera wearers. Um, you got a hint of that in some of those cool occupations I was highlighting a couple of slides ago. Um, and here's a distribution of what are the self-reported occupations for everyone in this data set. Remember, it's 900 some people. It's not just graduate students. As much as we've loved data sets of the past with grad students and we'll always love and perhaps need them, this is allowing us to get outside of that. You have landscapers, chefs, construction workers, nurses, pharmacists, and on. Furthermore, you have a, balance, a, a distribution of gender. You have a different balance across the, the locations that I've mentioned, including five different US states. And you have age um, variations, so from 18 years old up to 84 years old in Ego40. Okay, and this was an important step for us to try and bring these cameras, you know, certainly not close to exhaustive yet, but a lot more locations and a lot more types of walks of life that we can now capture that Ego visual experience. Uh, let's see if we can see the titles here or there. Um, so how did we capture? Um, in Ego40, there's a variety of different cameras. Um, all of them head mounted. Um, a lot of it GoPro, like you see on the left, with that, which has a nice advantage of being able to kind of tilt the camera towards where all the interesting hand object stuff is happening. Um, but also some that are looking straight out, like Vuzix or Z-Shade, and even some, some amount of um, stereo data on the right-hand side with WeView. And the idea of diver diversifying the cameras was thinking, let's make a big resource that's not overfit to a single device and get some variety and, and um, different advantages of these devices in terms of battery life versus field of view. And this is how these, the, the different ones um, vary. So also how we captured was to do from the very onset um, great legwork in terms of privacy and ethics review. So every institution that was capturing did their, whatever their counterpart for IRB or something like it, like a review process to establish what are the standards for the collection as well as the data management and then licensing with uh, informed consent for participants and then licensing for proper use of the data. And so this is great. Um, you may be aware that other data sets that um, we may have been, you know, folks that may have deployed in the past don't come with this kind of rigorous um, policy accompanying it. And this, we expect, helps to make it a very lasting resource for your video research. All right, so about the what then, um, in terms of modalities, I said we'd come back to this. I've talked a bit about the diversity, the scale. Um, so what's in it, and, and also what's in it in the content. And then the modalities um, have some richness as well. So more than half of the data has the audio captured and available with it. Um, that includes conversational, speech data, and also kind of sounds of the ambient scenes and actions. There's IMU for a large part of the data. There's some amount of stereo. And also 500 hours worth of data is captured in locations for which there are 3D scans available too. The other modality that I wanted to call attention to is language. So with Ego 4D, for every single clip, every single frame, there's accompanying timestamp to what we call narrations. And these are natural language, free form, play-by-play -play descriptions of the actions of the camera wear. So, and you're seeing some of them here in the white text on top. And C refers to the camera wear. So the camera wear closes the bottle, picks up the circular saw, removes the nylon entangled on the saw, drops the saw on the plank, and so on. So giving you that natural language semantics about the activity that's present um, at a scale that's um, quite high. So more than four million sentences like this, to give you sounds like every minute there are 13 sentences like the white ones I'm showing there of this dense descriptive narration text. Um, and we did this in order to have a great way to immediately index this vast sea of video by keywords, 
um, but also to establish from the ground up or from the bottom up the taxonomies and the actions and the objects that are present here for the, the task to start to work with. Um, in the time since, the release, a uh, number of researchers have done some very interesting things with this language, like learning representations from video language, thanks to this nice time-stamped um, coupling of the two signals. All right, so along with having good data to do things in egocentric perception, we also want to kind of organize and formalize what are the important tasks there to, for us to be, um, as a community, to be addressing. And so with Ego4D, there's a set of benchmark tasks that try to do just this. And so when I say set of tasks, it means we've defined the task input and output as well as how to evaluate it and provided pretty extensive annotations to, pro to allow for training as well as evaluating methods that do these tasks. To give you a sense of just how much is extensive, it's about 250,000 hours of um, annotator time went into creating the annotations that support these benchmarks. So what are they? Um, they take you in terms of egocentric egocentric perception from the past to the present to the future. So you can organize the tasks in this way. So in the past, this is where we talk about episodic memory. The ability to ask questions about everything that happened before in a long egocentric video. And it can be questions about object location or events and happenings like where did I leave my keys um, or um, where was I sitting when I had the dinner last night. So any kind of question, including in language, that can be asked about past video. The next set of tasks deals with the present, um, one uh, in terms of hands and objects. So I hope that some of those samples showed you just how um, rich uh, and intricate the hand object manipulation is in this data, which by the way has then uh, potential utility for starting to translate into um, dexterous robot learning, as I motivated earlier today. Um, and so this hands and object task is about what am I doing, how am I doing it? including, has, uh, as I say, the camera wear, transforming or uh, manipulating objects. The other part of the present deals with social aspects and multimodal aspects with audio, with um, two tasks. One on audiovisual diarization, being able to transcribe everything that was said in the video. And by the way, these are so unscripted in real world, it's, it's upping the game, I'd say, for the task of AV diarization, because um, people talk over each other, they speak in non-formal conversational terms, and this makes the task harder. The other, kind of, the other part of this task is social interaction, being able to predict from the ego video um, who is paying attention to the camera wear. And then finally, moving into the future, we wanna be able to anticipate what's next. And so um, in the forecasting task, this is about predicting, given the video we've observed so far, what's the next, next likely actions and active objects in the scene. Okay, so we put forth these challenges as a group um, with the Ego4D team as part of like the, the resources that go with the data set, but we've also been hosting, um, at this point now, the, as of yesterday, four challenges across the last two years um, to allow people to come together and compete and improve on the baselines we originally established. And improve, the community certainly has, so the results have been climbing and climbing. Um, this chart is showing the participation that's been climbing and climbing. Um, this year, 85 different teams participating. It's almost 100 unique methods applied to the variety of the benchmarks I just described. Um, and so then um, the composition of those teams is, in fact, both industrial labs, here shown in yellow, as well as majority um, led by academic teams. Um, and we like to call this out to, to um, um, make clear the barrier to entry. You know, it's a large scale, largest of its kind kind of resource for this this area, but um, even in academic teams, just the way the data is provided and other um, kind of helpful things we, we, we give access to in terms of features, et cetera, um, allows this kind of access across the board. So we're very excited about the progress on the benchmarks that's being made, um, as well as increased participation around the world. <coughs> and we're excited to see that, you know, as um, expected, but not able to pinpoint exactly how the, the Resource of Ego4D, you know, coming out of the computer vision community is nonetheless um, facilitating work and other kind of sister domains, particularly robotics, um, also machine learning, um, a little bit in linguistic, cognitive science, linguistics, cognitive science, audio, and multimedia. And this is depicted here in terms of just references to the work since early this year. All right, so 
In this part of the talk, I showed you how we are going um, to go from kind of noteworthy things in video to everyday things in video and capturing unscripted daily life activity as broadly as we can, geographically, as broadly as we can, demographically. Now, in this um, midpoint of the talk, I'm going to transition from what is the everyday to what is still unscripted but is skilled activity. And this is where I'll start talking about a new resource that we just introduced um, here at the conference called EgoXO40. Okay, so let's talk about human skill. Um, you know, you can imagine watching an artful pass from a soccer player, um, or listening to a touching piece of music, someone playing the guitar, or you watch the bike mechanic as they fix up your bike, or you watch your brother as he's cooking his famous dish. You know, it abounds kind of the, the ways in which human skill presents itself from kind of, again, the everyday things as well as kind of our aspirational things we want to get better and better at. And what's really interesting, I think, thinking about human skill captured in video and AI is that there are some core challenges that we have to address to, to, um, to get there. So why we would want to do this? Well, I motivate at the onset kind of the ability to have assistance in AR, say for learning new skills as, as me as a human user, or to transfer what we humans do to the actions of robots. But if we're gonna do this and really understand the kind of skills I'm suggesting, we have to understand their subtleties and um, all the visual components thereof. So for example, exactly how this person is positioning their hands on the guitar, or how they move them, and how they're holding the object. Secondly, um, we have this challenge of being able to capture the link from what we see in others' actions onto our own actions. So just stop for a moment and think about the last time maybe you tried to pick up a new skill that was somewhat physical, meaning you had to use your hands or your body to do it, um, and you're watching someone else do that. Well, you, you have honed this ability to translate actions of you see as an observer onto yourself, um, and it's really a core principle of visual learning. We need AI to be able to do the same and to be able to relate what are two different views, say here, a guitar coach or teacher, um, to here, a learner's view. Um, and that means, you know, some ability to, to, to um, have a variance to viewpoint, but these are kind of such dramatic viewpoints that it requires, um, as we'll see in a minute, new capture as well as eventually new models to establish this link from first person, egocentric, to third person, or exocentric. Again, I've been motivating this problem and the ego exo here from like human learning. Um, but again, uh, hu uh, robot learning, we have encountered the same kind of thing. Imagine the robot watching you, shutting doors, et cetera, and then transferring that onto its own behavior. And again, as a motive at the onset, cognitive science and developmental learning, where um, we see our first caregivers um, illustrating, demonstrating, and then we map it onto our own actions. Okay, so there's something there um, that we need to translate into our representations and our models for AI. All right, so here we go. We have kind of a domain of skilled activity we'd like to understand better. We'd like to know how can we start to capture and represent the ego exo link. Um, and about nearly two years ago, um, the consortium that I mentioned earlier came together again and in fact even grew in its membership. And so here you have the ego exo 4D group that came together to establish this ego exo 4D data set. And we wanted to focus on skilled activities um, and here the, here's the ones we chose. So we, looking, we were looking for domains where there was subtle human skill that would be visible. There was kind of complementary and diverse information between what you'd see as an observer versus an actor. Um, and we came up with these domains, cooking, health, you know, like first aid, um, repairs, particularly bicycles, sports, particularly basketball, soccer, um, music, and dance. So these are all things that require either um, heavier on kind of physical um, display of skill, and, and in other cases, kind of procedural senses of skill, where there's certain steps that you have to take in order to achieve a goal. So here's what Ego XO 40 data looks like. So taking in those domains, here's some excerpts. Here's um, bouldering, which is one of the sports I failed to mention on the previous slide, cooking. And what you're looking at here is an Ego XO collage. So these are time-synced views from calibrated cameras uh, where on the right you have these ego cameras, four of them stationed in the environment. On the top here, these are two SLAM cameras from the egocentric view, and then here's the main RGB SLAM, uh, the RGB egocentric view. And again, just as my kind of reel before, this is a set of excerpts from Ego XO4D 
It comprises about um, uh, 1,200 hours of content across both Ego and EXO. And you're seeing what some of that skilled activity looks like. Um, again, the cameras are time synced. Um, the EXO cameras are all calibrated and there's detailed um, pose information also on the Ego camera throughout. And I'm letting this play to give you a sense, again, of a bit of that geographic diversity, thanks to our um, collective consortium, and uh, as well as this complementary nature of the views between what you see as the actor and what you see as the observer. And so notice that, of course, there's more about the body, um, the full body pose visible in the EXO, whereas the um, and hands and close to the body object interactions are visible <coughs> in the ego. All right, so we're very, you know, um, happy to have now the chance to see these skilled actions, again, with their different visual instantiations around the world. So um, similar recipes will be cooked slightly different ways and with different tools and different environments depending on where it's captured, as you can see here for cooking an omelet in different places. Now, we went from you know, an Ego 4D kind of unscripted but everyday kind of activity, just capturing everything, to a more focused collection that here, as I just described, involves skilled actions, the ones, the domains I already mentioned. Um, with that meant recruiting people to wear these cameras who were at varying levels of skill, but including high experts in these different domains. So in this case, there were more than 800 participants who wore cameras, um, and their expertise spans a lot of very um, impressive credentials, right? So um, pro and college athletes, um, dancers who do jazz or salsa or Chinese folk dancing, competitive boulderers, pro chefs who serve thousands of people a day, um, bike techs, and more. Um, so there's a variety of skill levels um, to allow us to look at the progression of skill in a systematic way across this video resource. Furthermore, we maintain a good amount of, of diversity, as in the past data set, um, 18 to 74 year olds, um, and a distribution of gender and ethnicity as well. Now, I've emphasized um, the skilled nature of the data, the domains that we focus on, um, and the fact that it's ego exo and performed by these skilled participants. The next thing I want to emphasize about ego exo 40 is its multimodality, and what that can mean for pursuing problems. Um, in, in the areas that I've been discussing for whether well, augmented reality, robot learning, and general perception. So the multimodal aspect of the data in part comes from the device we chose for the egocentric camera. So this is a glasses, uh, the, the ARIA glasses, which has a glasses form factor and includes the sensing that you see there. The RGB camera and SLAM cameras we've looked at on my slide before, but also has two eye tracking cameras to give gaze of the camera wearer, seven microphones to provide spatial audio, um, as well as these other sensors like I'm used, barometer, and magnetometer. Okay, so this is really an all-in-one place, kind of egocentric capture of not just the visual world, but these other more physical um, uh, complementary observations. Now the EXO cameras, they happen to be GoPros in our setup. Uh, and so here you're looking at um, where they're demonstrating the, the camera calibration and time sync process with four EXO cameras on tripods, those are the GoPros. Um, and then the ARIA would be worn on the head, like within that environment. And these are all time synced, and we keep up with the process of lightweight, fast, um, and we share this out as part of the data set to do, to do replicate this kind of uh, capture. <coughs> all right, so I wanted to then illustrate that multimodality and what it can do for us and hopefully inspire some of our next research questions now that this kind of data is available at scale. Um, so here what you're looking at in the corner is the egocentric view. For someone in the kitchen, this is one of our pro chefs over at Meta. Here's a boulderer. Um, and then these are the reconstructed um, camera poses for the EXO cameras, as well as the Ego one in green. And that red line that you see, that's the gaze of the camera wear. And then the point clouds that you see about is because of the state-of-the-art um, slam-based reconstruction from, um, from the, the ARIA cameras. And um, I've already mentioned the gaze, spatial audio, eye new language, um, and also body poses we'll see in a second. And so here we can just think about the the way um, in which the true 4D nature of this data set can let us now look at problems that really bring together activity understanding and 3D geometry reconstruction and sense of place. Right? So we have those kind of tightly woven observations of both those things um, that I think these new challenges will allow us to do new things in terms of the 
to the representation approach taken to, um, taken for them. Okay, now and the last modality I want to um, stress on this data set is the language. Um, we had language in Ego 4D, or I, you know, some moments ago I described the narrations, kind of the play-by-play -play description of the cameraware's actions. We did that again here. So you have the exact same thing of kind of play-by-play, -play. here we call it atomic action descriptions. Um, but there's two more forms of paired language that comes with Ego XO 4D. Um, one is uh, narrate and act. This is our nickname for what is the spoken content by the person wearing the camera in 10% uh, uh, of the takes where they do kind of a how-to-like description of what they're doing. So they go through the skilled activity and they also talk about it. So, you know, maybe she's saying, here we go, left, forward, right, back, one phrase, etc." And that's spoken, recorded, and we also transcribe it out with ASR. Um, the third form of language that accompanies this video, uh, also quite exciting, is called expert commentary. So I've motivated this whole thing by, we want to capture people in the wild in an unscripted way doing things that they're very good at and that take human skill to do. Furthermore, we want to enable this kind of new problems, new challenges in skill learning from video. And so this language resource for extra commentary is where we had third party experts look over the content of this video, pause it anytime they had something to say, and comment about the skill, any weakness, any things specifically to improve about the camera's, wearers, camera wearers activity. So here are two um, experts doing this, and I hope our audio will allow you to hear an example from basketball now. So this is where I would need my audio. I wonder if everything's gonna fall apart if I turn back on my sound. You know how I would try. Huh? You know how I would try. Okay. Let's see if we can hear without pain. All right, so what you're gonna hear is, um, is the expert commentator in action as they watch this video, pause it, and then speak about the action. Yeah, and unfortunately, because of the Zoom setup, um, you can't hear it. I think we weren't able to share the sound. So she was saying things, oh, there's no, I don't know it memorized enough to tell you what she actually said. This is a, a basketball coach who's looking at this saying, oh, I like the movement right here. It's good. He's looking. He knows exactly where he wants to go. Um, and you notice we gave the tool, too, to get these spatial annotations, which we also provide with the data. Okay. And this is really cool, because there were some 50 hired experts who did this commentary across the domains I told you about, dance, basketball, cooking, and so on. And you have now this language of coaching, of kind of commentary of how to evaluate the skill and how to make it better. Oh, and this one also needs sound. Um, is there any way that we can get sound to work in the room, at least, even if not on Zoom? Well, this will be something we'll post later so you can check out. Um, I love these excerpts um, where these are some of our experts talking about their experience of what they notice, including like, these are, you know, professional teachers and coaches and so on, but what they notice about the video, but including this ego exo dynamic and like what that reveals and what this kind of study was, was doing and what AI could mean for this kind of coaching um, uh, endeavor. All right. So, the benchmark tasks then, I already mentioned those that are um, accompany Ego4D. Those are on the right-hand side of my slide. Um, but with Ego XO4D, this new resource, um, we have tasks that again are trying to look at what are the fundamental problems with egocentric perception, particularly for skill learning. And so that's where we came up with these four areas. Proficiency estimation, being able to gauge the level of skill from video, key step recognition, knowing exactly what fine-grained step a person's doing. 
ego exorrelation, the relationship between those two views, as I motivated before, and ego body and hand pose. So I'll show you examples of those benchmark challenges through um, snapshots of annotations. So here's the key step recognition challenge where we want to be able, even from the ego-centric view alone, um, be able to recognize these fine-grained labels about what they're doing, like placing the skillet on the stove, putting away the skillet, and so on. And so during training, methods may use both ego and exo, or one or the other, um, and then it's tested on the ego-centric view alone. The second benchmark family is proficiency estimation. And look at these. On the top, you have a novice ego and exo view for a boulderer. On the bottom, you have an expert. And if you watch for a little bit, you might be able to discern kind of the relative skill difference or experience level of these two people um, based on what they're doing. Um, but I also bet you can imagine how putting this as a task for our models, for AI, you know, it's gonna push, push a lot of new challenges, right? Can you be able to detect the level of proficiency from the video? Third of the fourth challenge is ego-exo relation. This is where um, we wanna be able to relate the, the interactions and the object use from the observer to the actor's view. And so here we pose this as being able to relate these wide viewpoint um, gaps for one object in the view to the same object in the next view. So in other words, you know, the bike from the front over here being able to do semantic segmentation and pairing across these very widely different views. And the final um, task centers around pose. So if you wanna know human skill, for many of the ones like the domains we've chosen here, you do care a lot about how exactly they're using their body, whether it's their hands or, or even the full, full body motion. And so we have, to our knowledge, kind of unprecedented scale of annotations as well as pseudo annotations for 3D pose on both of these. Okay, and then I would call for participation. So I've highlighted the challenges in Ego4D. We have a healthy community growing there. 85 teams competed just yesterday. Ego Axo 40 had a teaser challenge yesterday on body pose with some winners already. Um, and we're launching a full set of all these challenges in July um, so that by ECCB this year, um, we'll have new winners on all these tasks. So if this interests you, please check out the website. All right, so before we close, I wanna then kind of step back and reflect. I've shown you two resources in this tutorial, um, Ego 40 and Ego Axo 40. They actually have a lot of things that are shared because they're unscripted, they both aim for diversity in place and in people. They are long videos by today's standards, minutes to hours long. We have new benchmark tasks and it's, there's video language resources. So all that is shared or similar. Um, and then on the bottom is where you, know, you can differentiate them. I'd say Ego 40 is um, multimodal but in a moderate way and we went um, very seriously multimodal for Ego XO 40. Um, Ego 40 is, more, is larger. 3,600 hours just of egocentric views. Um, but it's ego only, whereas in ego exo, of course, you have ego and exo time synced. Daily life in ego 40, skilled activity in ego exo 40. And then variety of cameras over here, <clears throat> as we saw today, <clears throat> and specific um, choices on ARIA. <clears throat> ARIA and the <clears throat> co pros. <clears throat> okay. And these resources, again, you know, are born out of the computer vision community and have um, been in use, um, certainly in the Ego 4D case by our community, but also broadening and enabling tasks um, in these related disciplines, like robotics, audio, augmented reality, speech, language, and 3D sensing. All right, so I'll stop here. Thanks so much for your attention and happy to have any questions. Okay, uh, thanks for the great talk. Do you have any questions from the audience? Yeah. Okay, please. Uh, I was wondering, so it seems to me like this data set is more like a human-centric uh, video where you can train a large corpus of data to perform human-level tasks. How could you relate to, like, for example, Open in Body X or other, those videos are collected uh, on a uh, robotic level, right? Can we leverage those uh, Ego 40, uh, the large amount of data to transfer the knowledge or whatever uh, into the robotic task? Or yeah, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, for sure, and it's happening right in the field. So there have been some really nice results coming from the robotics side where they're finding that the, the visual representation, even just the base visual encoder that you can train from Ego 40 has an advantage for the robotics task. 
And it, you can explain it by really that distribution difference of seeing the everything, the everyday stuff um, over Ego 40 versus like those kind of noteworthy or internet style kind of captures. I think, so I think where the biggest gains have already happened in that regard um, are for like representation. I think there's early efforts, including from my group at UT, to take um, not just you know the base encoder, but think about like action learning and you know imitation learning, learning from demonstration and things. Um, um, and so early results there too, um, but a lot more to go as far as think about you know dexterous manipulation, transfer that we would seek. And I'm quite optimistic for it, like including here at this conference, seeing the kind of 3D hand extraction now that's possible, you know, applied to data like this that that we now have this. Um, greater and greater chance to do. Yes. I wonder for the ego ego center camera view. I think this is slightly different from human view since it's limited. But human view you can you can see a lot of things around. I just wonder because our input is slightly different than what human can see. Yeah, for sure. It is, yeah, you're right. And you know, first of all, there's a variety of it because the different, in the case of Ego 40, the different cameras, you know, have different fields of view and even camera placements. Like the GoPro is looking down, you see actually more than the eyes would see in terms of very close to the body. Um, by the way, when we, ten years ago, when we did some early Ego video capture at UT, um, we started letting our camera wearers know to kind of look down a little more. <laughs> they were wearing, you know, heads up cameras actually on the ear. And like when you eat and things, you don't have to look at your food. It's just there and you do it. Um, but you can you can capture that with a more deliberate viewpoint like the GoPro down. Um, but back to your question on is it human view? It's like different approximations of and not identical to for sure. And the field of view, like the width that you refer to as part of it as well as the placement of the camera. Um, I think in general, um, the variety, like the heads up cameras versus the GoPros allows to look at that difference a little bit. Um, in the Aria, you just have a even wider because you have two slam cameras looking very, very much to the side. I think more, if you wanted, if you're looking at this from the cog side perspective, I think you'd want to take a post-processing step to try and align those observations as close as you could to the parameters of the human visual system. Yeah. Okay, maybe last two questions, please. So I, the numbers I don't have off the top of my head, it's, um, so how much expert commentary is there? Um, it's on the majority of the data and it was free form stop and go, so you know, they could elect when to stop. What I don't remember is the, the number that I have to come back to with of how frequent that was. By memory, it's, you know, and watching these, it's like every moment or so, you know, there's a lot to be said. Um, we did tell them once they were saying the same, like, because sometimes in the behavior they'd have the same comment about every single time they did the drill, so then we'd say, we'll just kind of be more brief the next time, you don't have to re-explain that. Um, but let's find out the density so I could be more concrete for you, but, you know, hundreds of thousands of statements that are made about it. And then what to use it for? Um, what I expect will happen is two things. One, in a very targeted way, you can imagine now learning um, uh, the how to look at and evaluate skill. So not just to say, oh, it's a novice, it's an expert, but to be able to make these kind of feedback statements. Um, and we have some work in my group and I think others like looking into this. Um, and then the other would be, I expect it's useful in a, in a very similar flavor to what people are able to do with this narration kind of commentary that's not skill specific, but nonetheless just having that channel of human eyes on activity with which to learn video representations um, opens up stronger, stronger encoders. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, one last question. Uh, please, uh, the gentleman in the middle. Um, thanks. Uh, I think it's very, very known, this, this data set, and it's a uh, very creative idea. My question is more about um, how you deal with the, okay, is there any video including other people, and how you deal with the privacy aspect of the data? And, um, because also I would like to know more about social aspect of where it's claimed to be social. Is a how crowded you can have the sequences including more other people in yeah. order to perceive <coughs> more 
social aspect of that. Yeah. Great, yeah, so in Ego40 there is, I wanna say 400 or so hours that are explicitly social, meaning there are multiple people, even in some of them they're all wearing cameras, but not all, and, and there's full consent in terms of sharing um, what's in there, including the audio and conversation. And so that's a good chunk, there's benchmarks dedicated to it, and um, you know, this is the social pocket of it. There were other parts of the Ego 4D data that are either more solitary activities like knitting or doing origami um, that don't have other people, or where, according to the, the IRB for that collection, it was not about capturing bystanders, and they're all de-identified. So you kind of have that spectrum, but a good chunk, I think it's 400 hours, is fully consented for social kind of um, exploration. And Ego XO 4D, because these are more controlled scenarios in the sense that, oh, it's a dance studio, they're dancing, and there's not like the notion of passerby, or it's a bike repair shop, same goes. So there, I think if you're looking for social aspects, it's stronger in Ego 4D than in Ego XO 4D. Okay, uh, that's the final of our <laughs> Professor Gromis speech. Let's thank her again.